to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Joining me today is their esteemed guest, the CEO of Economic Development Lethbridge, Trevor Lewington. Now, as we navigate the evolving landscape of municipalities on the show, our focus today is on the year ahead, where municipalities across Canada anticipate a myriad of economic challenges. Trevor, with his extensive expertise, will be our guide through this terrain. Now, over the next half hour, we'll dissect the economic forecast for 2024, analyze the potential hurdles that municipalities might encounter from external factors impacting local economies to internal strategies that can be employed. Our discussion aims to provide insights that are not only informative, but actionable. The fiscal backdrop facing local municipalities is a critical aspect we'll delve into today, exploring the challenges they face and, importantly, how they can proactively overcome them. With the looming specter of higher-than-average interest rates, we'll explore how municipalities can navigate these fiscal waters and remain resilient in the face of economic uncertainties. Now, our dialogue will extend to the crucial topic of the labor force as well, shedding light on the expectations for 2024 and the pivotal roles that federal and provincial governments will play in ensuring the survival and growth of municipalities. This is Municipal Affairs. Trevor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of the forecast, and I want to start by asking... 2023 has come and gone, and we are in the first few weeks of 2024. Are municipalities preparing for a better year economically than in 2024 than they were in 2023? Yeah, I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to that question, if, if, if we're honest, right? And that's that's a typical weasel economic forecasting sort of uh, answer. Everyone should have an economic forecast, even though it's going to be wrong. Uh, you know, at, at, at on one hand, we've seen pretty pretty strong resilience in the job market, right? The economy has been strong, jobs have been created. We're we're fairly confident there. We haven't seen much tension there. But on the flip side, you know, we haven't seen a lot of housing starts. We've seen you know challenges with the inflationary environment. So I I think it really depends. Municipalities are facing increased costs, no question. Materials cost more, labor costs more. There's still those same inflationary pressures which in turn puts pressure on the Bank of Canada, maybe not to come down as quickly or as soon with some of those uh, interest rate reductions. And so that, again, adds to debt financing that municipalities are challenged with. It adds to household finances. But fundamentally, the economy seems fairly robust and we haven't had any concerns with the job market. So it's hard to know exactly where things are heading. And there's sort of pros and cons on both sides. You talk about some of the major concerns that municipalities should have, whether it be uh, housing starts, whether it be economic forecast. What is the biggest pressure that municipalities are going to be under? Is it inf infrastructure upgrades? Is it going to be the retaining and attraction of new residents to sort of increase their tax base? What is municipalities looking at in 2024 to sort of weather the economic forecast that we might be going under? I think nationally what we're hearing, or certainly what I see on the news quite a bit, is this idea of housing, which isn't really a municipal issue as such. Arguably, those are provincial and federal issues or should be. But at the end of the day, you know, part of attracting the right workforce, retaining people in your community is having places for them to live or to rent affordably. And, and I do believe there's going to be continued pressure there because we have not seen, you know, the same kind of private sector investments in housing. Uh, municipalities are still facing costs, you know, and that's costs from all things, whether it's the infrastructure you put in the ground pipe just simply costs you more or the, you know, the skilled labor and the engineering support that you need to make that happen. So I think that broadly speaking is causing some issues. I mean, I think my situation here in Alberta, particularly in Southern Alberta, the weather is actually increasingly a big concern for us. We're going in potentially to what is our third season of drought. And we're already, you know, it, it's minus 40 something ridiculous today. Welcome to Canada, everybody. Uh, we're all used to that. It's just part of the package. But, you know, it's it's snowing today, thank goodness. But we've had a very dry winter. We've had a very seasonable winter. And for us in this region, and I think it affects, you know, BC, we've seen the same thing. We're already drier than we were at the beginning of last year. And so all of those crazy forest fires, all of that dry land farming that was impacted, we had 
declarations of states of agricultural emergency across Alberta. For this region in particular, that could actually drive a very different economic forecast if we don't see precipitation. And I think, you know, the storms in the east, we've seen other things that are much more regional in nature, but are certainly going to be top of mind for municipalities as well. Are rural municipalities under the, are similar economic issues than urban municipalities? Because we, we talk about what you just talked about, the agricultural disaster that many municipalities yeah. in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even if I'm not mistaken, some in Manitoba declared over the last uh, 24, uh, 12 months. But urban issues are not going to be the same in rural issues. There are going to be some that overlap. But for the most part, do you see sort of a convergence of both and sort of them separating and saying, OK, these are going to be the rural forecast economic issues that they're going to be facing compared to urban issues? Yeah, I mean, clearly there are differences, you know, Metro Toronto as opposed to, <laughs> you know, northern Manitoba. However, you know, I think I'm, I'm here in Lethbridge, of course, we're surrounded by Lethbridge County. 20% of the city's econo economy, you know, 20% of GDP comes from primary agriculture. So, you know, the, the impact around us has a significant impact on ourselves. And I think the Edmontons, Calgary's, other municipalities across Canada, frankly, we're very interconnected. It's not as distinct and different as sometimes people like to draw that line. You know, that said, clearly, you know, if you're in a mining community or a forestry community, if that particular sector is not doing well, then that drives very unique concerns for your specific location. Uh, but, you know, certainly there's a lot of overlap. Rural municipalities are having difficulty with housing, for example. How do we attract and retain talent? How do we stop people from going to large urban centers? Which is arguably the exact same issue that large urban centers are having in terms of how do we keep and attract talent here, right? Uh, the, the inflation pressures, the cost of whether it's asphalt or PVC pipe going in the ground, it, those same cost pressures apply to large, small municipalities, rural versus urban. The nature of the work, the nature of the projects, they're all different. But I think every municipality is struggling with revenue. We're all challenged with, you know, moderating tax increases and offsetting downloading from other levels of government. All the issues, rural versus urban, I don't see a lot of distinction sort of on that macro level. We've been talking about housing a lot over the last few months, and we've been talking yep. about housing over the last like five minutes in this conversation already. Um, this is a federal issue. This is also a provincial issue. This is also a municipal issue. Right. It seems like the parties are wanting to come together to sort of create a uh, environment that is more prosperous for housing starts in 2023. Do you see that spilling over in 2024? And do you see the partnership that the federal government with municipalities is going to continue yeah. in 2024? And do you see a role that the province has to play? I mean, we've seen some announcements, particularly CMHC funding as an example. We've seen the federal government come to the table in a few select centers. I wouldn't say it's really a national program in scope. Certainly, you know, smaller municipalities, I don't think have seen the benefit yet. So I'm hopeful that those pilots, those initiatives will carry forward, that we'll see successes that create momentum. But no question, we need collaboration, not just with the provinces, but also municipalities themselves, right? And you know, that could be neighboring municipalities banding together and finding solutions. We don't necessarily need community housing or a seniors lodge in every small town and village across the country. Where can we concentrate? Where can we take a regional approach? But as municipal leaders, we have a responsibility to work with our provincial and federal counterparts, just as they should be working together as well. Uh, now, one of the big concerns about housing starts is the lack of labor force that we saw in 2023. Is that yeah. going to spill over in 2024? Or are you seeing more and more pressures from provinces and federal governments to say, OK, guys, let's get into the construction business to sort of help alleviate some of the pressures or bringing in foreign trade workers to sort of right. alleviate some of these pressures? Yeah, I mean, when we look at employment across the country, it's still relatively strong, you know, ignoring the sort of standard fluctuations that happen in the unemployment rate. I think for the most part, there's still a national shortage of skilled labor, particularly in those trades where, you know, construction activities require. We have seen the government very focused, uh, federal government very focused on immigration and continuing to bring people to Canada with the skills necessary to grow our economy. So there's clearly a balancing act there. There's been a number of sort of opinions out there lately, in particular, that immigration is also fueling the housing crisis. So, uh, you know, the same tool we're asking or relying on to fix this thing uh, can't be the same thing that drives the challenge. And, you know, again, there's lots of people smarter than me that can then argue the individual merits of that. But job, 
you know, job creation is a focus of every government, but creating the right jobs, attracting the right talent, maintaining the right talent. I think, you know, particularly in about Alberta, I'm closest to, there's been a real investment back into post-secondaries, particularly in the, in the, in the trades, the skilled trades. And so again, governments have a responsibility to help nurture and identify the, the ways they can help support the economy and support the areas where there is a specific issue or need. We're seeing a lot of uh, pressures on the small business, particularly in Alberta, that because we were both from Alberta, I'm going to stick on that. What sure. can municipalities do to sort of foster a relationship that can give small businesses on that verge of potential closure or bankruptcy because of the inflationary pressures that they're under, sort of a leg up to move into 2024 and give them a sort of a fiscal footing? Or is there a role that the province and the federal government can play as well to help municipalities foster more economic growth in the small business world? Right. I mean, I think the first place is to start talking to you to your businesses, right? So if you're a municipality, even if you don't have formal economic development staff, do your elected leaders, do your administrative staff actually get out there and talk to business? What specifically do they need? Right. So as an example, we've just completed our annual Brighter Together business survey here in Lethbridge. And it's been interesting to understand that although cost pressures have been identified as the number one concern. So it's no longer about the availability of workforce, but actually the cost of workforce, the cost of interest and debt, the cost of you know inputs was identified in our survey as the big concern. But the other question we ask is where can we help you? And the top five things that people are asking for help on were related to workforce. So even though these businesses identified directly in the survey, cost concerns, cost pressures, are, are their number one concern where they're asking for help is still related to finding and retaining talent and automating processes and those kind of things. So I think, you know, we, we sometimes have to be a bit careful to get real granular. And in your, your specific community, do you understand what your industries are looking for? And everyone, of course, will say, well, we need tax incentives, we need cost breaks, rollback, utility rates, whatever it is. Uh, but not, you know, to me, it's it that's not necessarily the case. And it could be that a particular industry or particular business needs help lobbying another level of government. You know, maybe it's a regulatory change that has nothing to do with the municipality, but a change of a regulation would really support them provincially. Well, as a municipal leader, we can go and have some of those conversations and advocate on behalf of industry as well. But, you know, how many of us as municipal leaders dig into that level of detail and really ask those questions to truly understand what the business community is looking for? So what should then, and I think you've answered a little bit, but I want you to exp ex expand on a little bit more if you can. What's the magic question that municipal leaders should be asking their business community? And I know that's a pretty poignant question, but yeah. everyone's going to have something d different in their community. But it seems like, and I'm just painting a broad stroke here, that workforce is going to be number one for a lot of communities because yep. people are moving away from smaller communities into urban centers. Uh, two, we are not seeing the demand for the brick and mortar stores anymore in communities. So the main downtown core is sort of depleting. Right. What is the magic question that a municipal leaders or municipalities should be asking their business community or even their chamber of commerce? It's probably not, I'm from government, how can I help? Uh, but it's a, it's it's along those lines, right? Uh, again, I think it's very specific to the community. Leaders, you know, it, it would be e easy for me to come up with a question, but frankly, I don't think it's going to be the same in every community across this country. I really do think that in municipal leaders know their community best. They know their stakeholders best. They probably have a much better sense than I would of what questions to ask in their community. And that's not a way to sort of avoid answering your question. But if you if you know that housing is the key concern, how can you probe that? If you believe it to be cost, how do you probe that? Maybe it's a you know permitting at city hall and how complex that is. I think again, talking to the different industries out there and recognizing that you know your builders, your development community probably has very different concerns than your manufacturers, who probably have very different concerns in your downtown business core. So. Again, understanding those differences and figuring out how each of us can play a role, I think, is is really, that's the magic question, is just asking questions and being willing to listen to the answers, right? And so sometimes we we get feedback and we hear that, oh, parking sucks, or your downtown policy sucks, or permitting timeline sucks. It, it, take that for what it is, right? If that's the perception, you know, we need to dig into why do people have that perception? Even if we've got benchmarks that say we're the best permitting department in Western Canada, we've got the fastest turnaround times. 
How is it that our residents don't know that? And so, you know, again, getting into the details and really understanding what's driving, you know, those concerns and those issues. Now, I want to move to taxation for a second because I think oh, everybody's is, favorite topic, everyone's favorite topic, because everyone's about to get their assessment notices over the next month and a half, oh. two months, if not, if they haven't already been sent out. We are seeing municipalities across this country, particularly here in Alberta, come out with uh, their tax rate increase, whether it be 5%, 2%, 1%, or even here in Calgary at 7.8%, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote right. me. I think that's correct. But how can, and in the context of municipal taxation, how can municipalities compete in this economic uh, sort of environment where every municipality is struggling and we need to attract and retain new people to come to our community without sort of seeing this 8% increase or 5% increase that some municipalities are under when it comes to residential property owners? Yeah, I mean, there's there's no question that municipalities and provinces need to have heart to heart conversations. We've seen that highlighted, I think, in Toronto, where discussions about potential new taxing powers and potential, you know, uploading of infrastructure, for example, you know, that key highways and things that municipalities perhaps or roads that, you know, maybe run through their community that they service and maintain today. Does that make sense if it's a major part of a provincial highway system that perhaps that should be uploaded to the province? I think there's some broader policy conversations that, you know, provincial governments, of course, are hesitant to have because they don't want to pay out any more money. But municipalities really only have one ability to raise revenue, and that's through municipal property taxes. So if we don't want to see those increase, municipalities at the end of the day have to have other tools in the toolbox. So that's the policy big picture side. The flip side, I do think that municipalities, councils, we have to have some real tough conversations with our residents and ourselves. And you and I have talked about this before on a previous show. You know, we have to make some trade-offs. Does every community need an arena and a pool and a library? Is there an opportunity to really pick and choose or do take a regional approach? And, you know, the small village where I'm from, Sterling, I'm the mayor there. That's my other job. You know, we've, we've been very meticulous about we only build what we can pay for. And it's not even if you get a grant and you get the capital costs covered, you have to be thinking about the long-term operational costs and, and having candid conversations with residents about their expectations. Because, you know, I'm, I'm happy to build whatever you want me to, recognize that it will show up directly on your property tax bill. So, you know, I think educating people, understanding those things, and, you know, the flip side, municipalities are businesses. And although we provide public goods, it's not an excuse to not take a business-like approach. So, you know, I come from industry. My previous employer, there was an expectation to provide productivity every year to offset inflation. And that was never easy, but there was a real drive to find efficiencies and a real drive to innovate and do things differently. And I think government sometimes gets lazy in that we will just, well, you know, that this is just the way it is, or that's the way we've always done it. Well, can you truly not just restructure for using that word and rolling out a new org chart, but can you contract out a service? Can you stop providing a service? Is there a service level change? Like we, as municipalities, we have to really think hard about what we do, why we do it. And are those necessarily activities that we should be doing or doing in the same way? And that's, those are never easy conversations to have, but they're critical in the long term. Looking at Canada as a whole now, uh, the Bank of Canada is going to be coming out here in the next few weeks, if I'm not mistaken, and announcing if they're going to be increasing the interest right. rates or keeping it at a whole. Um, do you expect the interest rates to start falling? And are we going to see a quick uh, rebound of the economy if they start falling quickly? Or are we going to see a stagnant uh, potential, not any changes until 2025? Yeah, my, my personal belief is that we will see some reductions, but not till the back half of the year. I think there's just way too many variables to consider at this point. Like not what? The least, well, you know, not the least of which is continued instability geopolitically. We have still a war between Russia and Ukraine, you know, that the, the potential impact on the price of oil there. We've got continued instability in the Middle East. American elections are always fun times, not only for the, you know, entertainment value of watching uh, the news broadcast, but just the the up and down of the economy and the potential implications with us as you know they're our largest trade partner. There's an awful lot of instability yet, and I don't think the Bank of Canada is going to be quite ready to commit to a decision at this point. And again, we've got this mixed message with inflation still well above their two percent target and kind of being sticky. So you know, are they really ready to start moving back? And 
even when we see reductions, my personal belief, again, is they won't be drastic reductions. You know, the, the times of 0.25 or 0.5 that we saw during the pandemic, I don't think that's in the forecast at all. And so if, if people are expecting a massive reduction from an economic stimulus perspective, I think quarter point, half point, that tops. That's all you're going to see sort of in the next year or two. And so the, the actual impact is going to be a bit more muted, perhaps, than some people are expecting. Is it a rosier picture for the province of Alberta because we are so reliant on the oil and gas industry and the, these prices are high, our sort of uh, budget surpluses in 2024 right. are expected to be higher uh, for the province? Are you sort of hopeful that this could be a trickle down effect for municipalities? For sure. I mean, there's no question that Alberta last year, you know, our GDP growth was around 2.2% is the latest sort of estimate that I've seen. That's going to moderate somewhat a little bit uh, going into 2024. The expectation this year is just under 2%. I think Saskatchewan's expected to surpass Alberta, but the prairies, Western Canada will definitely outperform the rest of the country. So the good news, selfishly for me in Alberta, uh, is that there is expected growth. So that's good news. Uh, and it will sort of outpace the national average. And the government, you know, the provincial government here rolled out what they call the Local Government Fiscal Framework, or LGFF, and it does have an accelerator built into it. So as provincial revenues increase, the funding to municipalities increases as well. So we've all gotten our allocation for 2024, and we already know, based on how the formula works, that we'll see about a 14% increase to that pot for municipalities in 2025. So that's the good news is, as, as provincial economic growth strengthens our economy, as provincial coffers grow from taxation, in Alberta, at least, that legislation does provide a, 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 that growth must trickle down to municipalities, but is a double-edged sword because it also works in reverse. So if there was a major economic contraction, that same formula applies and municipalities would see their funding cut. And it's a it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's, it's part of the formula. So you know, I think it's a it's a positive step forward in Alberta that municipal funding is tied to growth. There is a direct commitment and a direct calculation, but uh, it, it can just as easily as we've seen in the past go the other way. Well, I know one min one municipal mayor in Alberta is upset with the formula, I'm assuming, because his funding gets cut the year in 2025. Out of all the municipalities, only one. So I want to ask one last question before I let you go, because I am taking up a lot of your time here, and I apologize for that. But no, I've got to ask... What are you looking at in 2024? What are the indicators that you'll be watching to sort of gauge how the economy is going to sort of either rebound or head into that dreaded recession if we're not already in one? Yeah, from you know, for from an from an Alberta perspective, the price of oil drives drives the bus, right? It is the fundamental key metric for our provincial economy as well as government coffers. And we did not see $100 a barrel oil as a result of the, the Ukraine situation. Oil has moderated somewhat as a result of OPEC cutting back and other things. But 2024 to me is a bit of a crapshoot. I don't know exactly what, what to expect there. You know, again, we've had warmer weather, so demand hasn't been there. Uh, but there's still risk. And I think oil could still be a surprise uh, outlier for us this year. And so that's definitely something to watch. Again, for us, particularly in southern Alberta, agricultural commodity prices, which will be tied not only to those global events, but also to sort of the situation on the ground here weather-wise, uh, will definitely be an interesting thing for us to look at. And, you know, strangely enough, there's, you know, rumblings of a potential early election federally, which, again, would be a destabilizing. It's not really a, a, an economic factor. But certainly it would put a potential change to things like immigration, to housing funding, all of which have uh, significant impacts that cascade down to municipalities. So whether it's a surprise election sometime this year or the scheduled election next year, we will be potentially looking at a change of government. We are going to see uh, pre-election, how shall we say, commitments uh, that sometimes drive policy discussions. And I think that's going to be interesting to watch as well. And at the end of the day, you know, obviously everyone's still watching inflation. That's that's I think drives everyone's sort of pocketbook. We're all waiting to, or hoping to see uh, prices come down on things, or at least inflation to stop. We won't see prices come down, but at least inflation will come to a stop or a, a slower pace. Uh, but even that's not certain at this point. There are still potential for supply chain shocks around the world. I mean, what's happening in Yemen is a perfect example of those global events that could bring supply chains back to their knees once again. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's going to be fun to watch. 
And now from a local perspective, as CEO of uh, Economic Development Lethbridge, what are yeah. you looking for locally to see if the uh, local economy rebounds? Is it those national pressures or is there something locally that you'll be watching? Yeah, we've had a very strong export growth each of the last five years. We've seen actually double digit growth from our manufacturing sector here. Manufacturing is about 15% of Lethbridge's economy. So for us, that's a really important consideration. You know, a lot of that, of course, going to US markets, but also Asia. So we'll be looking to see what help our manufacturers need, uh, whether there's supply issues, whether there's labor issues. Uh, for the most part, Many of our local industry have found solutions to their people problems. And certainly, uh, interestingly enough, the change to uh, international students being able to work full time has been a part of that, which I hadn't anticipated till I was talking to a, a local employer recently. So for us, manufacturing is a key sector. And so make, you know, making sure we understand supply chain and export issues, making sure there's no trade disputes. You know, when our government picks a fight with another government and they shut borders, that's problematic, as we've seen with commodities in the past. So we'll be looking at that for sure. For us, the housing sector, and, and I don't mean this from a housing perspective, but, you know, construction and uh, commercial and institutional permit values have moderated somewhat in the last couple of years. So we're looking at the investments planned by all three levels of government in our community. We have two very large post-secondary institutions that are a significant and important part of our economy. So We've seen, particularly in Alberta, there was a number of years uh, in the last, prior to the last provincial election, where the public sector contracted. There was, you know, clear spending cuts. Many of our post secondaries took a twenty percent haircut on their budgets. And for Lethbridge, with a very large public sector presence, we're a regional hub, so we've got a regional hospital, you know, a number of provincial government offices. That was very painful as well. Uh, the current government has started to reinvest back or at least, you know, refund some of those programs that were cut and make strategic investments. So for us locally, that that has a potential to help bolster the economy as well. Trevor, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about the economic forecast. We'll probably bring you back on later on in the year to give an update. But thank you so much. Always appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for having me. Now, if you found today's episode insightful and informative, we encourage you to take a moment and hit that subscribe button. By doing so, you ensure that you stay abreast of all our latest content, ranging from the municipal affairs to the in-depth insights of the cross-border interviews and the revealing exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, as a platform committed to providing comprehensive coverage of all things municipal, we aim to keep you well-informed and engaged. Now, your support is crucial in enabling us to grow and maintain the high quality of content that you've come to expect. Now, if you find it within your means, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, regardless of size, goes a long way in sustaining and enhancing the depth and breadth of our programming. Now, you can find the link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website, conveniently located in the show notes. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.